So first off, I think it is extremely important to emphasize the notion that there, the, the, the existence of the meaning crisis in some ways is actually a good thing. Um, there's a paper at the end of Belonging Again, part one, that's called The Meaning Crisis as a um, Sign of Hope. And the idea of it is like we have to realize that when we talk about the meaning crisis, a risk can be that metaphorically it sounds like we ran into a dead end. We were wandering around. We went through a door. Suddenly the door slammed shut behind us and we looked and we're like, oh, crap. We made a wrong turn and now we're doomed. Like, what are we going to do, right? It's important to realize that we actually do know how to get meaning. It's called xenophobia, nationalism, closed-mindedness, war, scapegoating. We actually do know how to get meaning. The issue is that many, many people today are choosing not to use those ways of getting meaning. And so the lack of meaning is actually evidence of a kind of ethical or moral or philosophical improvement. Now, there are a lot of people today who are going back to old ways of getting meaning, and that's a problem because they're going into, say, conspiracies. Conspiracies give you meaning, you know, othering war. Like, they're going back to old ways to give meaning that require violence or immorality. But there are a lot of people who, the people suffering the meaning crisis tend to be the people who are choosing not to use those old ways. So it's more like, metaphorically, you have that image of um, Thomas More is the image I use from the movie A Man for All Seasons, who was executed because he refused to grant the, queen, the, the king a divorce. Uh, because Henry, I believe he wanted to, and Thomas More's like, I'm not going to do it because it goes against my beliefs. And he, uh, and he ended up getting executed for it. There's a nobility in that. Thomas More at any point could have left the prison simply by giving the king the divorce, but he refused. Does that mean that um, Thomas More did not know how to leave the prison? No, no, he knew. The fact that he didn't leave the prison was actually a testament to a certain sort of character, right? I think it's really important to see the meaning crisis that way because it gives you kind of hope for the moment. It gives you inspiration to think it through. And metaphorically, you don't think about the meaning crisis as evidence that mankind did something really stupid because that's right now how people think about it. Oh, we made a big mistake. We don't know how to get out of this. Oh, we're so dumb. I guess we're doomed now. No, you need to see, I think it needs to be seen as more like a Thomas More thing, which is for Thomas More, another way to look at it, you are holding out until you can find a better alternative, until you can find a way to give meaning that is not falling back on old ways. Um, because, you know, if Thomas More could have, say, for example, found an interpretation of the Bible and Christianity that would have led him to conclude that it was possible to say grant the divorce without betraying his values, then he could have done so and not say had bad character, right? So likewise, if we can find meaning today without, say, going back to old ways of finding meaning, well, that's perfectly fine. But in that way, the meaning crisis then is a testament to some sort of improvement. And I think that's really important because if you lose that, you may give up the improvement and go back to old ways that then calls a uh, collapse of who knows what, uh, all sorts of problems. And so I think that's really important that what you were pointing out. I think also another way to look at it is as you move from poverty to kind of wealth, or as you move to more technological advancement, it will no longer do, it will no longer suffice to simply try to determine right and wrong according to law. You know, what is illegal and what is, um, you know, it's illegal to murder. Okay, but what choices should I make? You see, this is the issue. As you gain freedom, as you gain technological possibility, you gain what? Choice. Law does not help you make decisions. Law simply provides the framework in which decisions are made, right? So here's the problem. As you move into increasing freedom, if you will, or potential, um, then you also get more choice. But choice is terrifying. And choice is anxiety producing. And so people then turn to find a metric by which to make choice that can be existentially stabilizing, and all they find is lol, or somebody says, well, do what you want to do. That's not nearly enough, because why do I want to do X and not Y? What, what does that say that I am? Ah, and then, pe and then eventually people don't want to make a choice at all because it's too burdensome to make choice, and then everything feels meaningless because they can't choose anything, and what they do choose makes them feel anxious, and there's a kind of meaninglessness that comes to all possibilities, a certain weight that comes. I think basically to, to say a bunch of really general things, what you see today is when you're dealing with very obvious problems like running water, food, 
health. Utilitarianism as a moral philosophy gets you pretty far because it's pretty obvious to say that what we need to do is to increase, say, food supply. Okay, that's great. But as you move to choice, you find yourself actually having to move into something more like value or virtue ethics that an Aristotle is going to talk about. Well, we basically spent the last hundred years saying virtue ethics are stupid. That value ethics are dumb and we really don't need that. All we need is algorithms for utilitarianism, um, increasing the greatest good. You know, the new movement now at out of Oxford is long termism, which is a very algorithmic. How do we increase happiness? You know, how do we increase well-being around the world using these algorithms, et cetera, so forth? You know, effective altruism, so on and so forth. Now, I'm not here to throw shade on those because all of those have a role. The problem, the, usually the biggest problems with human beings is not that they're entirely right or entirely wrong, but that there's overfitting or underfitting. Utilitarianism or effective altruism in terms of problems of basic facticity, running water, health, givenness, is very effective. The problem is when you overfit that moral philosophy and act like it will also help you with choice, basic individual choice on what you're going to do with your time, what you're going to do in your marriage, what you're going to do in relationships, stuff like that. Effective altruism can't help you make choice, but you still have to choose. Well, how in the world do I make choice then? Oh, well, you'll figure it out. No, no, you will not. Uh, you, you will not if you don't have a lot of training or you have any community or institutions to go to. And, and those aren't provided because actually people are like, well, if you provide those, aren't those kind of oppressive? Because you're like almost forcing people to live or to make choices one way versus another. So we don't provide those. But that means everyone is left alone on their own to decide their standard of choice making. And how do you even start? Because how do you even choose your standard of choice making? And where do you even get that? And how do you choose X instead of Y? Ah, so then if it's, it's all meaningless then because I can't decide anything. And so there's, so there's a chaos. So a lot of what's happening, in my opinion, is an overfitting of moral philosophies, because it must be understood that if, if there, where there's increasing choice, there's a need for increasing ethics. Ethics is not merely law. That's one form of ethics. But there's also ethics that is individual valuation and what you think is good, and therefore you choose. That's another side of the ethical equation. Well, that's more of Aristotle. We don't teach Aristotle. We don't even know what that guy's talking about. And so we're confused. And the last way I'll describe this is that the movement in the Paradiso of Dante, when you're in Inferno, it's sin, not sin, good, bad, you send you're here. But as you move to the, and this is very, there was a presentation we did on it at Philosophy Portal with the Lacan Conference. But as you go to heaven, Beatrice, it's all about timing. She says to Dante, if I smile too soon, it will kill you. You have to ascend slowly to be able to handle more and more grace and possibility and meaning and motivation. You have to develop character to handle more righteousness. And if you get it too soon, it will destroy you. Well, that's, that's not just law then. That's not just utilitarianism. That's an art form. That's a gradual process of developing to handle more and more freedom, more and more possibility. We do not as a society have a Beatrice model. We as a society do not have a virtue or value ethics model. We have utilitarianism or sin or not sin, inferno, that we are overfitting in more prosperous nations and, and acting as if that will give people what they need to make individual choices when it will not, then people's alone, they don't know what to turn to, and they become, they become hopeless. They become atomized, or they turn back to closed-mindedness because it, when I didn't think about things, then I knew what to do. Like when I, was just, when I just was dogmatic, then I had direction, so I don't want to think about anything. But in order to stay closed-minded, you have to avoid the other. You have to avoid diversity. Because diversity, by definition, makes you realize that it could be other, and that destabilizes your dogma, right? So then you start moving away, and everyone tribalizes again. So we do not, as a, so I'll get, there's more to be said, because another thing that comes up is, like you were talking about the list and saying everything you could go on forever. There's something today where when you look at like, well, let's take Tolkien. Everyone loves Tolkien. Yeah, you know, Lord of the Rings. What does everyone do when you meet a character in Tolkien? They tell you their story. I'm Vamir, son of, I come from Rivendale. They give you a story, right? We're probably entering an age where you almost have to return to something like that, where when people meet one another, they give you their story because when I give you my story or my lineage or my family, I'm telling you my position. Now you know where I stand in reality and you can talk to me uh, because I can, because I'm dealing, because I don't know what tribe you come from. I don't know. So this is my story. 
And also, there's some sort of skill that's going to be needed. It's almost like an ability to actively make intelligible something you have never encountered before while you're meeting it. There's no, like, you have to have that ability actively, which is more philosophical. So there's, so there's something, so I said a lot, I'll give it back to you. There's something probably about the return of story for introduction that has to happen, the ability to apprehend something you've never encountered before actively in the encounter to make it intelligible so you can relate to it. Um, and then three, there has to be an understanding that what is needed today is abilities to say, do like virtue ethics, value ethics, there are different terms for it. Beatrice and the ability to have standards for decision making in a manner that also is aware of difference so that you don't alienate difference, but stay open to the other so that you can have relationships. So I give it back to you.